Okay, uh, hello to everyone. I'm very happy to see you all. Today, we have the honor of having Offer Arahony, who is going to tell us about towards an explicit theory of quantum gravity. So Offer, take it away. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation and it's, it's great to give a UBC seminar again, even though it's, it's from a distance, but yeah, hopefully sometime soon. Uh, uh, also, uh, I'll be able to come and visit. Uh, so yeah, so, so this talk will be about our attempt to construct an explicit theory of quantum gravity. Uh, I'll start by uh, reviewing the ADS-CFT correspondence, emphasizing uh, uh, an aspect of it that's usually less emphasized, which is the fact that there is a limit where it can be viewed as relating to weakly coupled uh, theories. And then uh, using that, uh, we'll attempt to derive the ADS-CFT correspondence for the specific case of the duality of vector models to high-spin gravity. And then I'll end with a summary in future directions. And this talk will be based on, on three papers that appeared over the last two years uh, in collaboration with our former postdoc, uh, Shai Chester, and two of my students, Erez Ubach and Tal Schaeffer. And please do stop me uh, with lots of questions. I mean, it's especially important for a Zoom talk. And anyway, I talk too fast if people don't ask me questions. So yeah, so please do. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, the basics. I mean, so the ADS-CFT correspondence uh, is the statement that quantum gravity on asymptotically anti space spacetimes uh, is equivalent to a d-dimensional uh, quantum field theory. And in some sense, it's a tautology because if somebody gives us some quantum gravity theory on an asymptotically ADS space in four dimensions or higher, which is the cases that I'll be discussing here, then it more or less automatically satisfies all the axioms of a, of a quantum field theory and, in fact, of a, of a conformal theory. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this correspondence is uh, automatic. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, we don't really have any... Uh, theories of quantum gravity in, in four-dimensional space uh, or higher. So we don't have any non-perturbative definition of, of the left-hand side uh, of, of this equality uh, for any of the known cases. So in reality, this is not a correspondence, but it should be really viewed as, as a non-perturbative definition of the quantum gravity theory in terms of the quantum field theory, which in many cases, we do know how to define non-perturbatively. And in that sense, uh, the challenge is to understand which conformal field theory corresponds to any specific uh, quantum gravity theory and precisely uh, how the two uh, are related. Now, of course, uh, this equivalence between two diff very different theories uh, at first sight sounds completely prepos preposterous, even though we've gotten used to it over the last 25 years. Uh, but in quantum field theory, we know many examples uh, of dualities where we can describe the same system using two very different sets of variables like particle vortex duality, mars fanier duality, S duality, and so on. And typically what happens in those cases is that we start at weak coupling with some set of fields. And then as the coupling constant increases, the we, so we start from some weakly coupled semi-classical theory, then we increase the coupling constant, the quantum effects become large and the theory rearranges itself such that at strong coupling, it in some cases could become equivalent to some completely different theory, which is uh, weakly coupled. So that's the typical behavior of dualities in quantum field theory. Now, in some sense, this duality is also similar to the quantum field theory dualities, except that, of course, here, one side is a quantum gravity theory and the theories live on different space times. But there's also one other important uh, difference between this case and the quantum field theory dualities, which is that in quantum field theory dualities, as I mentioned, the small h bar expansion of one theory typically maps to the large h bar expansion of the dual theory. While in the ADS-CFT correspondence, the situation is more interesting because we can have two independent parameters of the uh, two theories such that the expansion in h bar on the two sides are not the same, uh, I mean, and also not the inverses uh, of each other. So let me illustrate this uh, in the prototypical example of the ADS-CFT correspondence, namely the duality between type 2b string theory on ADS-5 cross S5 and the 40 n equals 4 supersymmetric SUN uh, young mills theory. So in this case, on the quantum field theory side, we have two parameters. There's the rank of the gauge group, N, which is a discrete parameter. And there's a continuous parameter, which is the gauge coupling of this 40 n equals 4 gauge theory. Uh, in this theory, the beta function vanishes. So the Jiang Mills is really a continuous parameter, which labels a family of conformal field theories. So we have these two parameters. And on the field theory side, the quantum corrections are governed by the coupling constant at uh, Mills, or in the large L limit, we can rearrange this as an expansion in powers of the two coupling uh, lambda, which is Jiang Mills squared uh, times n. So those are the parameters on the field theory side. On the string theory side, well, there's one dimension full parameter, which is the scale of ADS, but that is, is just some overall scale on that side. And in addition to that, there are two dimensionless parameters, and we can take one of them to be, uh, say, the Planck constant in, in the 10 dimensional space of type 2b string theory measured in units of the curvature of the ADS radius. So L will denote the radius of curvature of ADS. 
So G Newton divided by L to the eighth is a dimensionless parameter. And this is the parameter that controls the quantum correction in this quantum gravity theory on ADS five versus five, for instance, the gravity loops are an expansion in, in this parameter. So this is the parameter analogous to H bar on the gravity side. And we also have another dimensionless parameter, which we can take to be the radius of ADS in units uh, of the string scale or the other way around. And that parameter controls the locality on the string theory side. So if the radius of curvature is much bigger than the string scale, then we have approximate locality at distances of the order of the ADS scale. Well, if they're of the same order, then the theory is highly non-local. And the way that the mapping between the two sides goes, at least for large N and lambda, is that this parameter governing the quantum corrections on the gravity side maps to one over N squared on the field theory side, while the parameter governing the quantum corrections on the field theory side, which is H bar on that side, maps to L over L string to the fourth uh, on the string theory side. So we really have uh, these, these two separate uh, expansions. So uh, if we go along the lambda axis, then the field theory goes from weak coupling to strong coupling. Well, when we go along the n-axis, then the gravity side goes from being weakly coupled uh, to just strongly coupled. Well, on the gravity side, what happens when we change lambda is that the theory remains at the same value of the coupling, but it goes from being relatively local for large lambda to being highly non-local uh, for small values of lambda. So the important thing about this uh, mapping is that we have this, this corner where n is large and also lambda is small, in which both theories are weakly coupled. So the gravity is not local on that side, but the H bar for both theories is small in that regime, so that both theories can be described uh, semi-classically. And that typically doesn't happen in quantum field theory dualities, but it does happen in this case of the ADS-CFT correspondence. Now, so far, of course, we do not have any derivation uh, of this correspondence. We have many tests, uh, mostly thanks to supersymmetry, but so far we do not have a derivation. Now, of course, as I mentioned, the left-hand side is not really well-defined non-perturbatively. So what a derivation would mean in this case would be to show that the super young mills theory reproduces the string perturbation theory uh, of the type to be string theory on ADS-5 crosses five. And of course, so far we have not been able to show this, which would be a, a derivation of the correspondence for this case. Now, the fact that we have in this case, a classical limit where N goes to infinity and lambda goes to zero suggests that probably it should be possible somehow to just write this as some change of variables. If both theories are classical at the same time and they're equivalent to each other, then there should just be some change of variables that relates them. But unfortunately, uh, already 25 years after this correspondence, we've made relatively slow progress in actually deriving the correspondence for this case. And the reason for that is that both sides are, even though they're classical in this limit, they're still rather complicated. The string theory side lives on a highly curved ADS space in this limit, and it's not so clear what are the basic variables that in which we want to describe this uh, string theory. The field theory side is somewhat simpler. I mean, it's just a free SUN gauge theory, but there's still a Gauss lock constraint that complicates the spectrum of the theory. So both sides are not as simple as we'd like them. Uh, so even though they are classical, so it would be nice to derive the correspondence in this case. We can, but presumably, if we can do it in the classical limit, we can then systematically expand an H bar on, on both sides and, and get a full derivation of the correspondence. And such a derivation would give us really an explicit mapping between the two sides that would tell us how to go in principle beyond perturbation theory and hopefully enable us to answer various conceptual quantum gravity uh, questions like should we on the gravity side include wormholes, uh, what happens behind horizons and so on. So there are many questions that having an explicit mapping would enable us to answer, but so far in this case, uh, we don't have it. So uh, in this talk, I'll focus on a simpler example where it is actually possible to derive the correspondence. And this example was suggested uh, 20 years ago by Klebanov and, and Polikov. Uh, so in this example on the field theory side, we really take the simplest possible theory namely just n free massless scalar fields. We'll take them to be complex fields, phi i of x, and we'll take it in, to be in three dimensions uh, of higher or higher. And the action is really just the free action of, of these n massless uh, scalar fields. Uh, so the only slight complication is that this theory has a un global symmetry. And in order to map to the gravity side, we, we need to have a theory that has a good large limit. So in order to get a good large limit, we have to project this theory onto singlets of this UN global symmetry. So we project both the operators and the states in this theory onto just singlets of this UN global symmetry. And that defines what we call the vector model, which does have a good expansion uh, in, in powers uh, of uh, one over N. So in this theory, we only keep the operators that are singlets of UN. So for example, the local operators can all be written as phi i, as sums over phi i dagger times phi i with some number of derivatives uh, in between them, summed over N. So this is obviously UN invariant uh, and 
the general UN invariant local operator can just be written as a product of 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 bilinear operators in the phase uh, of this type. And in particular, uh, for any spin J, we can construct an operator like this uh, with J derivatives, which is a, a primary of, of the conformal algebra, and which is actually a, a conserved uh, current. So for spin one, this is obviously just the current of the U1 global symmetry. For spin two, this is the energy momentum tensor. But in this free theory, we similarly can construct currents of any spin J, and they're all conserved. Uh, so that corresponds to some big high spin uh, symmetry group that this uh, free theory uh, has. Over, so, uh, I just yes. have a question. Uh, yeah, do you, do you care what, are, are we working on the sphere or, or does it matter? Uh, it, it doesn't matter now, but it is going to matter uh, later. Uh, so most of the time I'll work on the plane or, or cool the, uh, on the sphere. Okay. But yeah, but, but I won't discuss until the very end uh, what happens in more complicated topologies. Uh, so yeah, so, so also we have this either on the sphere or, or on the plane. So either on SD or RD. And yeah, nothing could be in Euclidean space for simplicity, I guess that was already implicit uh, in the way that I wrote it. Thanks. So any more questions about the setup? Okay, so that's the field theory side. And then in order to map it to ADS space, then the rules of the ADS CFT correspondence tell us that if we have some conserved current of, of spin J, then that maps in the bulk to some massless spin J field that lives on a D plus one dimensional ADS space. So the dual theory should have these massless spin J fields for all spins J from one to infinity, uh, including the graviton to the spin two, of course, but it should also have these massless spin J fields for any spin. So that's what's called a high spin gravity theory, uh, which has massless fields uh, of all spins. Now, people have tried to write down such high spin gravity theories uh, for many decades, and uh, it turns out that theories of this type cannot be written consistently, even classically, uh, in Minkowski space. But it was shown, uh, I think, around 30 years ago by Vasiliev that in anti de Sitter space and also in de Sitter space, it is possible to write down classical theories of interacting high spin fields, uh, which are consistent, uh, at least uh, at the classical uh, level. So these theories have some huge uh, gauge symmetry. Of course, just from the spin two, we have the diffeomorphism symmetry. And these high spin massless fields come with generalizations of this that give uh, a huge high spin uh, symmetry uh, or high spin gauge group uh, that these uh, high spin gravity theories uh, have. Now these theories, uh, their equations of motion are now local. So at, at, at a typical scale L, so again, the L is the radius of ADS space here. So these theories are as non-local as they could be, namely they're non-local at this typical scale L of anti de Sitter space. And they have just uh, one single uh, coupling constant, which we can take to be the gravitational coupling, say, of specifically of the spin two field. But the same coupling governs also the, the coupling of, of all these spin J fields. It turns out that the high spin symmetry constra constrains all the couplings to be uh, essentially equal uh, to each other. And to some, and there's almost just a unique theory of this type. I mean, with a few caveats, uh, there's basically just a unique high spin symmetry of this type that's consistent uh, even just at, at the classical uh, level. So the natural conjecture is that this high spin gravity theory uh, on anti de Sitter space should be dual uh, to this uh, uh, UN uh, vector model uh, in, D, uh, in D dimensions. And the natural identification is that the parameter one over N on the gravity side should be identified uh, with the gravitational coupling uh, on this high spin gravity side, namely with G Newton measured in appropriate units such that it's uh, dimensionless. And uh, in this case, so this is analogous to what we saw in the previous case, but in this case, this is really the, the only parameter. Of course, on the field theory side, we have here the free theory. So there's no analog of H bar here on the field theory side, but H bar on the quantum side maps to this one over N parameter, such that in the large N limit, we again have this phenomenon that both sides are classical. So it should be possible to just uh, write down an explicit map between them. Now the gravity side in this case, not too much is known about it. In fact, all that's known about it is really just it's classical equations of motion. Uh, there isn't even any action from which uh, these equations of motion are derived. So it's not so clear how to go about defining any quantum generalization of these high spin gravity theories in the absence uh, of, of an action. Uh, so, so far, nothing is known about the quantum theory on the gravity side, but again, uh, we can, it is known classically, so one can't, one can't test this duality, at least in this classical large N limit, and some correlation functions have been compared in this limit to give evidence uh, that this uh, duality is correct. So our goal in this talk will be to derive this duality, where in this case, again, the gravity side is only well-defined classically in the large N limit. So what we mean by a derivation of this duality is to show that the large N limit of the quantum field theory really gives a high spin gravity theory on, on anti-de-sitter space, and then, for any finite value of n, then 
we can use the quantum field theory to give us a quantum version uh, of these high-speed gravity theories. Of course, since we don't know anything else about these quantum versions, then uh, any construction would provide us with a with a quantum high-spin gravity theory. So that will be the goal of, of the rest of this talk. Now, of course, the bonus, so in addition to deriving the idea of CFT correspondence, if we can really construct such a mapping, then it will also, by construction, give us a quantum high-spin gravity theory. I mean, I guess it's not obviously that it's unique, but one can assume that it would be really the, the unique quantum high-spin gravity theory, which would be dual to these uh, UN uh, vector models. Uh, now, of course, this example does have a big disadvantage compared to the previous example, which is that the gravity side in this case is very different from standard gravity theories that we'd like to understand uh, at the quantum level. In particular, we have here all these massless high spin fields in addition to the massless graviton, and we don't have any locality. I mean, the theory is really non-local at, the at the ADS scale. So those are, of course, disadvantages of this example, but uh, the hope is that if we can understand the mapping in this toy model, it will still teach us uh, something also about more general cases and perhaps uh, point uh, as to where we should go. So this is uh, the end of the motivational part. And uh, next, I'll start uh, describing how we construct this mapping. Uh, but before that, let me stop for uh, any questions uh, about the setup and the motivations. So the high spin gravity is weakly coupled at large end? Yes, that's right. And that's just because of large n factors. So, so again, large, and, and one of our n maps to the coupling constant on the gravity side. I mean, so in the, on the gravity side, there is a unique coupling constant, which can be taken to be, say, the three graviton vertex. So once you know the three graviton vertex, that determines all the other couplings. And we can just call that three graviton vertex, I guess, square root of G Newton or something like that. And then G Newton in units of the curvature radius is the unique dimensional parameter that we have. So. In the large limit, that coupling just goes to zero, and we just are left with free high spin fields. And then we have an expansion in one over n that is is the quantum expansion of this high spin gravity theory. But again, not, nothing is known about the quantum theory so far. Are there black holes in this uh, classical theory? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. I mean, uh, so uh, people constructed, I mean, so it's not so obvious how you would identify a black hole in these theories. I mean, uh, so for instance, the, you, you could try to ask about the curvatures, like the curvature in this theory is not gauge invariant under, so this theories have a huge symmetry group that is much bigger than diffeomorphisms. It has all these high spin transformations. And for instance, the curvature is not invariant under these transformations. And it's, it's so it's very difficult to, and also the causal structure is, is not invariant under them and so on of, of just the, the gravity part. So it's far from clear how you would identify what you mean by a black hole in this theory. So people have constructed solutions that they claim to be black holes, but it's not obvious how you would know if they're black holes uh, or not. Is, it, is there a Hawking page transition? Yeah, so, okay. So, so that, right, so, so, so that part is, is known, but to discuss that, we first have to ask even if, if we can put this theory at finite temperature. Uh, so already putting this theory at finite temperature is is, uh, is is subtle, but I mean, of course, you can you can take this high spin gravity theory classically and just put it on on thermal ADS space, just so that that you can do. But it's not so obvious if, if there is since we don't know a black hole background, it's not obvious if there's another background that it could correspond to. Now you could ask from the field theory side, does it have does this field theory have a Hawking page transition? But for that, uh, you have to give a few more details on precisely how you project onto the singlets of this UN global symmetry. So, I mean, in flat space, you can just impose that projection and it's perfectly consistent. But if you have a circle, then uh, the only consistent way to impose that projection is to actually include a, a UN gauge holonomy around that circle and to integrate over all possible holonomies. So, so to do that, that, you really have to introduce also UN gauge fields. And so, so that we actually don't know how to know in general dimensions. So in general dimensions, if you introduce UN gauge fields, then you would also necessarily introduce dynamics of these gauge fields or extra degrees of freedom and so on. So in most of the cases, it's not even clear how to put these theories at finite temperature. So that's also partly why the black hole uh, case is, is question is, is somewhat subtle. There is one interesting case where we do know how to do that, which is the three dimensional case. So in three dimensions, we can couple this uh, this vector model to a UN chern simons theory and take the coupling constant of the chern simons theory to, to infinity. So since the chern simons theory doesn't introduce any extra fields, then that does impose this projection to UN singlets in a consistent way without introducing any extra degrees of freedom. So in that context, we do know then how to put that theory also on, on a circle, say on S2 cross S1, and we can ask if that has a, a Hawking page transition. So that was analyzed by, by Schenker and Yin, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, 
2011, I think. And, and they found that the theory does have a Hawking Pates position, but somewhat surprisingly, it happens at a temperature that, that scales like square root of n. So it's not something that you would expect to see classically. I mean, so for any, I mean, so since the classical limit is the large n limit, so for any temperature that stays fixed in the classical limit, you would always uh, be, 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 be in serve in, in the low temperature phase. But it, once the temperature goes above something over a square root n, which presumably you don't really know how to analyze classically, then there should be some phase transition in, in that case. But yeah, but since it's not something classical, it's not obvious that that should correspond to any classical black hole solutions. So unfortunately, it doesn't shed light on, on the question that Moshe asked. OK, any uh, more questions? OK, very good. So let's uh, get to the duration. So. As I mentioned, this duality was suggested already 20 years ago, and there have been various attempts to, to derive it. In many of these attempts, people try to identify the radial direction of ADS with their randomization group scale uh, uh, of this uh, field theory. But uh, I think none of these attempts is completely satisfactory. I mean, they have various advantages and, and disadvantages. In any case, the method I'll describe here is a different method where we won't use any randomization group uh, identification. But we'll do what's sometimes known as bilocal holography, which I think was originally suggested uh, for these theories by Dustin Javitsky, again, almost 20 years ago. And uh, it, in particular, will follow some work of Dimelo Kocidal uh, from five years ago, four years ago. And uh, this type of holography is also similar to what people often do in, in the context of the SYK model. So some of you may be familiar with it from there. So the basic idea of this bilocal holography is that, first of all, we notice that in this quantum field theory, we project onto UN invariant operators, and all the UN invariant operators in this theory can be expressed in terms of a bilocal operator that we construct in an obvious way, such that it's UN invariant by just taking the sum of phi i dagger x1 times phi i of x2. So this is obviously a, a UN invariant operator, and one can show that all the UN invariant operators can be expressed as products uh, of of these uh, of these uh, Gs. Obviously, you can get the local operators by just doing a Taylor expansion of this by local as x2 x process x, x1. That gives all these spin j local operators that I described before. But of course, the by local contains more information than just the Taylor expansion. So this is a more general class of by local of, of UN invariant operators. And the claim is that these are really the only UN invariant operators that can be constructed. And here, it's important that the gauge that we're really imposing UN invariance, say if I would only take SUN invariance, that there would be extra baryon type operators and, and so on. But for UN, the claim is that these are really the only UN invariant operators, which means that uh, on the field theory side, really the all the questions that I can ask about these UN vector models are just to compute in this theory, some correlation function, say, of some products say, of these Gs or, or deformations by these Gs and so on. So anything that's UN invariant can be expressed in terms of these by locals G. So the type of object we want to compute on the field theory side would be the path integral over the phi i's with this free action and then with some functional of this uh, g. And our goal in this talk will be to see if we can rewrite this path integral, which is, again, the most general object in this UN vector model, to see if we can rewrite this as a path integral of some quantum high spin gravity theory living on ADS space, where we would have some path integral over field phi j, which would live in ADS space, so with some extra radial coordinate z. We'd have some action for these high spin gravity fields, and we'd have some functional f tilde, which is map. I mean, which is a mapping of this functional f that we have on the field theory side. And what we'll see is that perturbatively in one over n, we'll see that it is indeed possible to construct mapping of this type, while non perturbatively we'll see that one has things are more subtle and one has to modify the gravity side somehow. So this, I guess, goes in line with the general expectation that gravity should somehow be emergent uh, in, in some semi classical limit, but it should not be viewed as a basic variable uh, that you do the path integral over. So in this case, we'll really see an explicit example uh, of that uh, phenomenon. So well, our goal will be to understand this uh, equivalence. Yes. So is there a singlet projection in this in the scale? Right. So, yes. Yeah, so, so here I was, so so G is already a singlet. So, so in this, so as long as I compute just a function all of this G, so say I could put in sources for G or deformed by Gs and so on. But since this is UN invariant, then yeah, then this only computes UN invariant things. So I don't need to, exp I don't need to explicitly impose any single uh, condition. I'm just computing only UN invariant objects. And since I'm only computing UN invariant objects, it doesn't matter if I project out the other stuff or not. I mean, it's, it's just going to be the same. 
Well, Again, in finite know. temperature, as I mentioned, it's most out of the finite temperature, but I'm doing this just in flat space. So in flat space, that's a precise statement that as long as I'm just computing UN invariant correlation functions, I don't need to do anything extra. Yeah, that's a global UN invariance, right? Not local. That, that's, that's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there's no UN gauge symmetry here. This is just a global UN invariance, and I'm only allowing myself to discuss UN invariant objects. So that defines for me this is the most general, if you want, uh, I mean, generating function for any UN invariant question that I can ask. And we want to map that to the gravity side to compute so the same for, objects in ADS for, space. For example, a complete set of states that you might insert between the operators in G, those would contain non-singlet, UN non-singlets, right? Uh, no, so, okay. So, so uh, for now I discussed it in Euclidean space, so I don't want to discuss the mapping, but yeah, if I, if I do it in Lorentzian space, then I would have to also project out the Hilbert, then I would have to add an extra projection on the Hilbert space to only UN invariant states. And then the G's of course would take a UN invariant state to another UN invariant state, but I would have to impose that sort of my initial state is the UN invariant state. Yeah, so in Lorentzian case, I do have to, to, to work a bit harder, but in this talk, I'll, I'll only describe the Euclidean case I and mean, we don't, we haven't worked out the Lorentzian case yet. So in, in the Euclidean case, this really is all that we need to do. Okay. Any further uh, questions? Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'll so show in what sense we can derive this equivalence and I'll show this in, in four steps. The first step will be to just change variables in the path integral from the original field phi i to this by local g of x1 and x2. Uh, the next steps will involve the conformal group SOD plus one one, so of course, the theory, the free field theory is invariant under this global conformal symmetry. And of course, also we want to construct theories on ADS space that are invariant under this isometry group of ADS space. And the main thing that we know about the duality is that it should map these two SOD plus one, one groups to each other. So in order to construct the mapping, we'll basically expand everything in eigenfunctions of this conformal group SOD plus one, one. So we'll take this by local field G of X1 and X2, and we'll just expand it in representations of this conformal group SOD plus one one or in eigenfunctions of this group. So we'll we'll have some expansion of this. I'll explain the parameters when I get there. I mean, uh, but there is some expansion of this G in eigenfunctions of the conformal group that sit in some irreducible representations. And then we'll do exactly the same thing on the ADS side. Also on the ADS side, we'll expand all the fields in eigenfunctions uh, of this conformal group. So we'll see that also on that side, we can do such an expansion. And what we'll see is that exactly the same representations appear on both sides. I mean, that's, that's a highly non-trivial statement, but the claim is that we'll see that exactly the same representations appear on both sides, which means that we can just map between the two sides by just identifying the coefficients of some specific representation on this side with the coefficients of the same representation on the other side. And this will give us a linear mapping between this bilocal field and the fields living on ADS space. Uh, and using this mapping, we'll be able to construct really an explicit mapping uh, from original path integral to this path integral over gravity fields uh, in ADS space. So uh, in the rest of the talk, I'll explain each of these steps uh, in turn. So let's start uh, from the first step. So the first step is purely in field theory, just changing variables from our original n field phi i of x to this by local UN invariant operator. So this step is purely in field theory, but it's subtle because this mapping is nonlinear. And the main subtlety here is that these variables g are not independent uh, of each other. For instance, if we take the simplest case where n is equal to one, so for n equals one, then g is just phi i dagger times phi i. Uh, sorry, there's only a single phi, so g is just phi dagger phi. And in that case, Obviously we have this relation that G of X1, X2 times GX3, X4 is the product of these four fields, but that's also the same as GX1, X4 times GX2, X3. So we have at any four points, we have this relation between these by locals. So obviously these are far from independent variables. And similarly, if we go to higher values of N, so we don't have relations as simple as this, but you can show that still products of N of these, of N plus one of these Gs are constrained uh, as long as n uh, takes any finite uh, value. So we have these uh, rather complicated constraints of the Gs that we have to take uh, into account. Now in order to analyze this more carefully, uh, even though we have a free field theory, it's convenient to regularize it by putting the theory on a lattice. So let's put the theory on a lattice that has V points. I mean, I don't have to specify any more details of the lattice to, to say that it has V points. And then if the lattice has V points, we can view phi i, x, phi I of x as a V by n matrix where and this index i goes from one to n and x labels the v different points in space time. So we can view phi of x in that sense as a v by n matrix. And in that language, this by local g, g is just phi dagger times phi as a matrix multiplication. And this is a v by v matrix since this of these x's has v different values. 
And then in this language, it's easy to see that the constraint on this matrix G is just that because it's a product of two V by N matrices, its rank has to be less than or equal to N. So this generalizes the previous uh, N equals one case to a general value of N. So in particular, what we see is that if N, the number of fields that we have is larger than V, the number of points in space time, then there are no constraints. So then these Gs are really independent variables. And in particular, this is the case if we first take the larger limit and only then take the continuum limit of having an infinite number of points in our space time. So this, uh, in principle, usually when we discuss these dualities, we want to take both the large n and the continuum limit, but we can take them in various orders. And we'll see that the specific order of limits when we first take large n and only then take the continuum limit is the order of limits that will reproduce for us the semi-classical gravity on a data zero space with its uh, one over n uh, expansion. On the other hand, if we want to discuss theories at finite n and take the continuum limit uh, first, in that case, we can still do some change of variables to these bilocal variables g. But in that case, we do have to take into account this rather complicated constraint that they obey, that the rank of g is less than or equal to n. So in that case, uh, the path integral over the g's will be uh, much more complicated. And again, it, it will have to incorporate these constraints uh, somehow. So in most of the rest of this talk, I'll, I'll focus on the case where we take the large n limit first. So in particular, that is what's relevant for the perturbation expansion on the gravity side, which is an expansion in one over n. So I'll, I'll focus on the case where n is bigger or equal than v. So in that case, the g's don't obey any constraints. So we can just do a change of variables from the original n times v variables phi i to these uh, v by v field v squared fields uh, g of x1 and x2. And it's easy to compute the Jacobian. So in this matrix language, the Jacobian is just the determinant of this matrix g raised to the power n minus v. And then using this, we can just rewrite our original path integral. So we can just do this change of variables, rewrite the path integral over the phi's as a path integral over g, where we can rewrite the free field action as it's, so it's just this term that's linear in g here. So the free field action, I remember, g again is phi is phi i at x times phi i of y. So this is an, another expression for the free field action. And then the determinant, we can write it as the exponent of, of the trace as usual, of the trace of the log of g as usual. So we can write this path integral. And this is, again, if as long as n is bigger or equal to v, then this second path integral is completely equivalent to the first one uh, that we started from. So this is, again, as long as we only discuss, of course, un invariant objects. Now here, it's, uh, we immediately see that this theory does indeed have a good large n expansion, which is uh, in this language, it's, it's manifest because we have n multiplying here two of the terms uh, in the action, this term and, and this term. There's also this term that involves v. So v here plays the role of, of a uv cutoff, if you want. I mean, it's the number of points in space time. So when we take the uv cutoff to infinity, then v will go to infinity. But for now, we're keeping it finite. I mean, and so this, but you should think of it as some uv cutoff. So uh, we have at a point of the larger limit, and then these terms with v, one can think of, one can think of them as counter terms that depend on the uv cutoff. In particular, if we want, we can do a large n expansion of this uh, path integral. Of course, we don't have to, but we could do a large n saddle point expansion. And in that expansion, one can show that the saddle point is given just by the expectation value of g in the free field theory. So again, g is just phi i dagger x1, phi i x2. So its expectation value is just the free scalar, the free massless scalar propagator, namely 1 over x1 minus x2 to the power d minus 2. So in the larger limits, it's useful to expand g as this uh, saddle point plus the deviation from the saddle point, which will denote as eta over square root of n. So when I can think of this eta as sort of a normal ordered product of these fields phi i dagger phi i, where we just subtract out the expectation value of, of where we do where we contract the fields at x1 with the fields at x2. So this eta is sort of a normal ordered version uh, of, of the of the bilocal. And then if we just plug this into the action, then we obtain an action for this bilocal action eta, where in this normalization, the interactions are manifestly suppressed by one over n, and we also have these counter terms uh, proportional to v. So by construction, when we do that, we're going to get an action that has a 1 over n expansion, which is now the loop expansion in this bilocal language. And by construction, it exactly reproduces the original free scalar quantum field theory. So just to give a few more details about how this works explicitly. So one nice observation is that this G0, if you view it as a V by V matrix, then it's essentially the inverse of the Laplacian, because the Laplacian times this propagator just gives us a delta function. So we can view this inverse of the we can write the Laplacian as the inverse of this matrix uh, G0. So that allows us to rewrite this sort of kinetic term in the action as just G0 minus one uh, uh, times the deviation of, or 
well, times g in general, but that includes a constant and this deviation term eta. So the, the original kinetic term becomes this term that's linear in eta. And then we can expand this log of g uh, again around this uh, saddle point. And we obtain uh, this form of the bilocal action where we have uh, a quadratic term in eta, which is in some sense, some Laplacian square term and uh, acting on this bilocal variable. We have various interaction terms, which again are non-local Laplacians acting on these products of bilocals. And we have these uh, counter terms. And if we want, we can, of course, explicitly check that this bilocal action is completely equivalent to the original free field theory. For instance, we can compute the two-point function of these bilocals. So because these are these bilocals are normal order, then the only contribution to this two-point function is if we contract the, phi, the fields at phi i with the fields, at, sorry, at x1 with the ones at x4 and the ones at x2 with the ones at x3. So in the free field theory, this is exactly equal to the product of these two scalar propagators. And one can check that this is indeed what we get from this action. So at leading order in perturbation theory, the two-point function is, of eta is just the inverse of this kinetic term, and that immediately gives precisely uh, this uh, answer for the two-point function. Then at the next order, in one over n, we have three different diagrams. There's uh, a loop diagram with two of these three-point vertices that come from here. There's another diagram with a four-point vertex coming from here. And there's a counter-term diagram, which involves two of these etas. And it's not hard to explicitly compute it and see that these three diagrams exactly cancel so that we are left exactly still with the free field result. And the same holds order by order in, in perturbation theory. So this is just a rewriting of the original free field theory in terms of this new variable eta uh, in a way that makes it manifest that we have a one over an expansion in this variable, which is the loop expansion. So are there any questions about this uh, first step? OK. Now, the second step is uh, a somewhat technical step of taking this eta now, this bilocal, and decomposing it into representations of the Euclidean conformal group SOD plus 1, 1. Now, the representations that are relevant here are the usual representations that we all know and love of the conformal group, namely the ones that involve just primary local operators. So a representation is specified by some primary operator that has a dimension delta and it has spin j and by the position y of that operator. And then we can build the representations of the conformal group in the usual way by acting with extra generators on that primary operator. Now, the original bilocal that we started from it was, I remind you, defined as phi i dagger at x, x1 times phi i of x2. So by construction, it sits in the product of two of these representations that have the dimension of the free scalar field, d minus 2, 2 over 2 and spin 0. So we just have to take a, pro a product of two of these representations at two different positions and decompose that product into irreducible representations of the conformal group. So that's something that's known already from the 70s, uh, how to do that. It turns out that this product can be expanded in representations that have all integer spins j and that have dimensions delta that sit in what's called the principal series uh, uh, of representations, and namely that they have dimensions that are d over two plus i s for real values uh, of s. So we can expand this by local and a sum over these representations that are labeled by the spin j from zero to infinity, an integral over delta that runs over this principal Carroll series from over this variable s and by the position y of the operator. So these three parameters label the irreducible representations of the conformal group. And then for each representation, we have some coefficient and we have some basis function for how to express the by local and that representation. So these are sort of the club score down coefficients for the taking the product of these two representations and getting this uh, dimension delta spin j representation. And so in this case, these club screw down coefficients are nothing but the three-point functions uh, that we would get if we would have primary operators of dimension d over minus two over two, which are scalars, and primaries of dimension delta and spin j. Uh, so of, of course, in our theory, we don't have these three-point functions. I mean, so this should not be confused with any correlation function in our theory. First, we don't have operators with these continuous dimensions of delta. So these three-point functions here just play the role of the club squared out coefficients for these products uh, of representations. Now, there's a slight subtlety here that this product of representations works nicely if the original dimension itself is in the principal Carroll series. So that's what was worked out in the 70s. For our purposes, we want to take it to be this value d minus 2 over 2, which is not exactly on the principal Carroll series. So we have to do some analytic continuation of these results. And in some cases, that means we have to slightly deform this contour. So in particular, it turns out that for the case of j equals 0, we have to slightly deform uh, this contour to, to add an extra circle uh, around uh, delta equals uh, d over 2 here, uh, sorry, uh, delta equals d minus 2. But OK, that's a, a small subtlety that uh, is on for uh, the experts. And in any case, the important thing is that 
we have this decomposition of the bilocal in terms of these irreducible representations. And again, these irreducible representations are a complete basis. So this expansion is also invertible. We can write any of the coefficients as this integral uh, of the bilocal, where again, uh, the coefficients appearing also in this inverse relation also turn out to be three-point functions, but in this case of what's called shadow representation, whose dimension is d minus uh, the original representation. So using this expansion, we can rewrite our original action of data in terms of these coefficients c delta j of y. So we can just plug in this expansion into our original action and write down the action that we get for these coefficients. Of course, we get rather complicated answers, but at least the quadratic term, say, is relatively simple. I mean, the quadratic term turns out to be diagonal in these variables delta and j, uh, but not, local, not diagonal in, in the variables y and y prime. So the quadratic action turns out to be a sum over j, so this integral over delta of product of these uh, two coefficients times just the two-point function uh, of, of these O delta. So of course, the action is obviously manifestly conformally invariant. And in this case, this is uh, the conformally invariant expression. So this is the second step where we uh, write everything in terms of uh, eigenfunctions of the conformal group. And the next step, we would like to move to the ADS side and also there expand everything in eigenfunctions of the conformal group. But of course, in that side, it's more subtle because it's not obvious what are actually the correct variables to use in a quantum gravity theory on ADS space. Of course, we really want to construct a full upshell mapping. And we know that on the gravity side, we expect the space time to fluctuate. So it's not, not obvious what the fields live on, except that they should live on some asymptotic the ADS space. But we don't a priori know what the space looks like in the interior. So uh, what we'll do is we'll take a very naive uh, assumption about the mapping, and we'll just assume that we can map to spin j fields phi j that just live on a fixed ADS background uh, given by this usual uh, Poincaré patch uh, metric. So of course, at first sight, it seems very strange to, to map to the gravity side to fields that just live uh, on a fixed background. But in fact, because we're mapping here to a high spin gravity, so of course, in usual gravity theory, that wouldn't make any sense because we obviously would need to include on the gravity side also fluctuations of the metric that take us away from the original ADS metric, which is just uh, the, the vacuum. Uh, but it turns out that in this high spin gravity theory, we have this huge uh, gauge freedom of, of these high spin uh, gauge symmetry. And it turns out that using that gauge symmetry, we can actually take any configuration and just map its metric to a fixed anti-distitor background. Or in other words, we can take any configuration and write, or write it at least for any small fluctuation around ADS space, we can always write it as just a fluctuation of, of high spin gravity fields that just live on a fixed ADS background. So this was shown a few years ago in a paper by, by Neyman. So in this case, it does not seem completely preposterous to assume that also on the gravity side, we can just take a fixed ADS background and write everything uh, as, as fields living on that background, or at least it's not a completely ridiculous assumption to make, so let's just make that assumption and, and see uh, where, we, where we get to. So if we make this assumption, then we have these fields living on a fixed ADS background, and then we can again just, uh, we know how the isometries act on this background, so we can again take these fields and decompose them into representations of the SOD plus one one uh, isometry group of ADS space. Well, Alfred, Please, can I ask a question yes. here? So, yeah, yeah, sure. So how does the coordinate Z appear? Because there, I mean, is it a combination of Y's or because there yeah, was so, no so coordinate? Okay, well, I didn't, I didn't get to the mapping yet. I mean, so you, you oh, mean okay, okay. when you I extract mean, the mapping? So yeah. yeah, we'll get to the mapping in a moment. So okay, yeah, for, sure, now, sure. It's, for, sure. for now, it's just uh, started from a fixed ADS background and yeah, we'll see how the mapping okay, works. Okay, here. Okay. Yeah, so here we just, so if I start with, mass the spin J fields living on ADS space and decompose them into conformal representations, a priori, I get more representations than the ones that I had in the previous step. But if we impose two extra conditions on these spin J fields, namely we impose that they're transverse and that they're traceless. So these are uh, consistent with the conformal group. So we can impose them where it doesn't break the conformal environment. So if we look at transverse traceless <laughs> spin J fields living on ADS space, and we decompose them into representations, it turns out that we get precisely the same representations that we found also on the field theory side. Namely, we can expand each of these spin J fields in ADS space uh, as a sum in this case of, well, I mean, the spin J that we expand in is the same as the spin J of this field, but each spin J field we expand in representations that have arbitrary values of delta, again, in this principal series, d over two plus is and some arbitrary position y. And we have, again, these coefficients. And in this case, the club square dot coefficient for the expansion are nothing but the bulk to boundary propagators from this point xz uh, to this point y, if it would be on the boundary of, of anti-decider space. So this is the bulk to boundary propagator for a field that would have a scaling dimension delta and spin j. So namely, they solve this Laplace equation in the bulk 
uh, with the mass given by, by this uh, specific value and with the appropriate uh, boundary conditions. So this is a well-known decomposition of, of spin J fields in ADS space into representations of the conformal group. And again, this is a complete basis, just as in the previous case. So the expansion in it is invertible and everything we can write in terms of the J's, we can write in terms of the C tildes and vice versa. So are there any questions about this uh, third step before I get to the mapping? Was it known ahead of time that those extra conditions are a part of the classical theory or is it a new? Um, no, uh, what is known, so you mean on the high spin gravity side? So yeah, so okay. originally in the high spin gravity side, the Vasiliev equations involve a huge number of fields that are, because it also involves this huge gauge symmetry. So it includes gauge fields for all of these gauge symmetries. It involves a huge number of auxiliary fields. And uh, it, it really has a very large number uh, of fields. But because of the huge gauge symmetry, there's an issue of, I mean, how, how do you gauge fix and, and what the physical fields are? So, uh, so there are many different gauge fixings that one can take. But what is Definitely known is, I mean, there is a solution of that theory that is ADS space. And what is known is what are just the physical excitations around that ADS space. So at least the physical on-shell excitations around the ADS background are exactly spin J transverse traceless fields. So at that level, the mapping is, is consistent. Now, of course, off-shell, we don't really know. I mean, because we don't have an off-shell formulation on the high-speed gravity side here, we're doing an off-shell mapping. So off-shell, we don't know what to expect on the gravity side. So we find that we have these fields, but I wouldn't have been too surprised also if wouldn't have had these conditions and they would have only appeared on shell, for instance. So it's not clear what to expect from that point of view. But it's certainly consistent with the on shell uh, degrees of freedom that we do need to reproduce. Yeah, I mean, offer also a question. Do you expect yes. even in principle that the mapping should work off shell? I suppose not, right? Because the gate. Uh, no, be in this case, uh... well, by construction, I mean, we are building it off shell. I mean, so in this case, we are. I mean, by construction, we're building it off shell. Again, of course, there's a question of should a gravity theory have any off shell uh, description and so on. But okay, the question is off shell in, in terms of, of what? So it's not clear. Uh, but obviously, on the field theory side, we do have an off shell description. I mean, we can describe any deformation of the theory and so on. And also on the gravity side, there should be some mapping of that. So again, we, we certainly expect something that's off shell from the field theory point of view. And so in that sense, it should also be off shell, but whether that gives us an off shell theory on the gravity side in the sense of a path integral over gravity field and so on, that's a different question. I mean, so that, but so but for now, off shell, I just mean off shell on the field theory side, because that's all that I really understand. So we're, we're taking the off shell field theory, we're mapping it to gravity and we'll just see what we get. So whatever we get is by construction, a correct description of some theory on the gravity side. Okay, any further questions? Okay, good. So, uh, so now we expanded both sides in these irreducible representations of the conformal group on the field theory side with these coefficients c, and on the gravity side with these coefficients c tilde. And now we can just map between them in an obvious way by just identifying the coefficients on these two sides. So that will give us a mapping that's obviously consistent uh, with the conformal symmetry. Now there is some freedom here in the sense that for every value of delta j, we could also put in some arbitrary factor between that, that would also still preserve the conformal symmetry. So there is some freedom here, and it's not surprising that we have a freedom because so far on the gravity side, we really haven't said anything about what, what we have. We just said that we have these spin j fields, but we haven't said anything about their actions. So in particular, we have a freedom of doing any field redefinitions of the bulk and so on. So it's not surprising that we get this, this big freedom, but for any choice that we make of these Fs, we can just construct a mapping that by construction is consistent with the conformal symmetry and that we can explicitly write. So since we could explicitly write the decompositions on both sides, we can now just convolute them together and get an explicit mapping from this bilocal field on the field theory side to the fields phi j on ADS space by this very explicit equation, where again, this is, these are the three-point functions. These are box-to-boundary propagators and these are known coefficients. And similarly, the inverse mapping we can also write from the the fields on the ADS side to this by locals. And again, it's a, it's a linear mapping, which is explicitly known. I mean, it's a bit complicated, but completely explicit. So this is the mapping uh, that we're going to assume. Now, given this mapping, we can now go to Panos's question of, of how do we schematically view this mapping from a bi local variable to local fields living on, on ADS space. So on the field, on, on the bilocal side, we have the center of mass coordinate of these two x, coordinates x1 of x2. So that obviously maps to the coordinate x on the ADS side, which is the coordinate parallel to the boundary. And it's natural to 
relate the distance between these two points x1 and x2 that's related to the radial coordinate. I mean, it's not exactly, I mean, it's not equal to it, so we don't directly map them, but I mean, scalings of one map to scalings of the other, so at least there is some relation there between them. And then once we took into account uh, the absolute value of the distance, we still have the angular variables of the distance between x1 and x2, and those we can expand in spherical harmonics, and that's exactly what gives us uh, these spin j fields uh, living on ADS space. So schematically, this is how the mapping works and how you can see that we have more or less the same number of degrees of freedom on both sides. But again, the precise details are given by this mapping. I mean, so it's not a, a local mapping of some specific distance to some specific value of z, but it's really given by this specific expression. And again, uh, our claim is that if you follow these rules of mapping to local fields on ADS, then basically that's the only thing you can write down because it's the only thing consistent with conformal invariance. So if there is any mapping in this classical limit, which we argue that there should be because there should be some classical mapping. So if it follows these rules, then it's basically the unique thing that you can write down. Of course, you could say that you want different rules where you don't map to local fields on ADS and so on, then, then all bets are off. But with these rules, this is essentially a unique mapping up to the choice of these coefficients uh, F delta J. So this is uh, the mapping that we use. And then if we just plug this into our action, then we automatically obtain an action for these fields phi j in ADS space, which gives us a quantum high spin gravity theory. Again, one over n was the coupling constant for these etas. And since we map it linearly, then it becomes the coupling constant uh, for these fields phi j in ADS space. The action we find is, is highly non-local, but it is completely explicit. And by construction, it is exactly equivalent to the quantum field theory order by order uh, in, in one over n. So this, these are all built in uh, properties. Now we still have the freedom to choose these coefficients f delta j, and it's convenient to choose them. I mean, we can't choose them the whole action local, but we can at least choose them such that the quadratic term in the bulk is, is local. So this specific ugly choice is the choice that makes the, the quadratic term in the action in the bulk local. So with this choice, then this is the quadratic action that we find in the bulk. So phi j is this spin j field, and it has this, quadr this local uh, quadratic term, which is however quartic uh, in derivatives. So if we would have only this this uh, this Laplacian term, then this term would be precisely the standard kinetic term that you would write down for a for a massless uh, spin J field uh, in ADS space. Uh, in our mapping, it turns out that we found we find these extra modes also uh, from this extra solution to the Laplacian. So again, we have an off-shell mapping. So uh, we we can we can have also additional modes beyond the, the obvious uh, on-shell modes. Uh, so in any case, this is just uh, the quadratic term uh, that we find. So it does exhibit uh, the obvious uh, on-shell fields uh, that we expect, but it does have some additional modes that we expect uh, to be some some off-shell modes uh, on, on the gravity side. Is there but uh, in order, problem? sorry, yes, questions. Is there a problem? Because well, this is all in Euclidean space, and, uh, and it is manifestly, I mean, since we started from a manifestly unitary theory, it's, it's obviously unitary also on the gravity side. So, and also, if, if we then continue in the natural way to Lorentzian space, we'll also get a unitary theory. I mean, there is a problem that naively in Lorentzian space, we would get these negative norm states, uh, but... Uh, so, so it's not completely obvious how unitarity will work in the in the Lorentzian case. So that's something that we still haven't worked out. But since we mapped, uh, uh, so if we do the mapping by the obvious analytic continuations on the on the field theory side, it will obviously be unitary. So the question is just precisely what rules that will give us for the Lorentzian theory on ADS space. So we haven't worked that out yet, but it's clear that there is some definition of the theory in Lorentzian space, which is defined by that specific analytic continuation, which will give a unitary theory. So that's uh, what, we, what we're assuming. But for now, everything is Euclidean. I mean, so we, but again, it's Euclidean and it's manifestly the same as the free field theory by construction. Now the interaction terms, of course, are more complicated. I mean, so this quadratic oh. term, yes, sorry, so questions question, before that. Is, is, is it clear why the quadratic term is absent? Is there any sort of symmetry that completes it or? It's, it's odd to do an expansion of stuff. Well, again, there is a quadratic term. It's just, it's just it has this extra. Oh, I see. It's quartic it's, it's derivatives. I mean, that's because the bundle collection is actually quartic derivatives. But I mean, okay, I, I mean, you can write this to serve as a difference between two quadratic terms if you want. I mean, so I yeah, mean, okay. there's this in the propagator. So in that sense, there is a quadratic term. I mean, it's not that there's no quadratic term. It's just that there's more than one pole of the propagator. So there's yeah, an okay. pole corresponding to some odd physical states. But it is, I mean, yeah, yeah. The physical states which sit here do obey exactly the usual equations of motion. So yeah. we do find the same on states as, as we expect. 
Now, the interaction terms, of course, are completely non-local. I mean, so for instance, this is the example of the three-field interaction term. So we have these integrals over the three positions in ADS space, but all these other extra integrals and so on. So we have an explicit action, but it is completely non-local and not very illuminating. But we can check explicitly, and we did that at least in one case, that you can do the computation also on the block side of some loops, and they do exactly cancel with the counter terms that we're also carrying over from the field theory action. So we can check that. And we believe that the resulting bulk action is some gauge fixed action of the high spin gravity in ADS space. Of course, in the way that we wrote the action, we don't have any gauge freedom on the ADS side. So it's obviously not the original Vasiliev action, which has this huge gauge freedom, but it's some completely gauge fixed, freedom, fixed version of that. And we're not sure exactly which gauge fixing you need to do to get precisely our action. But we believe that since the high spin gravity is unique, then probably there is some gauge fixing that will give precisely the equations that, or the action that we have, but we didn't show it yet. Now our mapping is completely off shell, but of course, in the if we do go to the on shell limit, it will reproduce the usual on shell relations. I mean, so we expect an ADS CFT that on shell near the boundary, the, the bulk fields phi j will go to these local operators OJ, and we can show that that is true on shell and so on. So we have all the usual uh, relations uh, in the on shell limit. We also have, I mean, one somewhat surprising feature of our mapping it is that we have also these bulk operators phi j, which are well-defined. So presumably that is because we work in some highly gauge fixed version of the gravity theory. So in that version, there is there are these local operators phi j, which are well-defined, but of course it's not that are, what are their precise properties? They certainly not are not completely local, although we do expect them to behave approximately locally a distance is much larger uh, than the ADS uh, radius. So are there any questions about the mapping? Okay, so I see that I only have a few more minutes. So let me skip the part about deformations. I mean, since we have an optional mapping, we can discuss also various deformations of the CFT and we can map them also to the gravity side. So we can discuss the deformation by a mass term to get a massive free field theory. And we can write the gravity dual of that. We can discuss the uh, the deformation to the interacting critical UN theory, we can discuss uh, gauging the one and so on. So the various deformations we can make and all of them are also completely well-defined in this framework. And we can write down explicit mappings for all of them. So we're, we're not limited just to the, to the free field theory for instance, we can certainly describe also the interacting UN critical UN model. And as usual on the ADS side, that's just described by changing the boundary conditions for the scalar field uh, in the bulk. But we can, in this case, we can explicitly derive it and we don't have to assume it. It just follows from the rules that, that we got. So let me uh, summarize. So I described how we explicitly constructed a quantum gravity theory on ADS space by directly mapping the QFT path integral to fields on ADS. The result is non-local as we expect, and by construction, it agrees with the quantum field theory to all orders in one over n, which is the expansion in, in bulk loops. So in that sense, this can be viewed as a derivation of the ADS CFT correspondence for the free vector model and for any of its uh, deformation. And similarly, it can be viewed as a quantum definition of the high spin gravity theory. Now for finite n, I mean, so within the one over n expansion, everything that I said worked, but for finite n, I remind you that our bilocal variables obey these very complicated constraints. And then if we map them to the gravity side, then we'll find that these gravity fields phi j obey the same very complicated uh, non-local constraints. So for finite values of n, uh, the gravity description seems to break down and we certainly can't just take independent gravity fields at different points, but they obey these very complicated constraints. So it seems that gravity is a good effective semi-classical description within the one over n expansion, but it's not a good variable to use in the quantum theory. And certainly for finite values of n, where we have the real quantum theory, we certainly cannot just write down a path integral over gravitational fields that are independent of each other and get the correct answer. So at least in this case, quantum gravity is not a path integral uh, over metrics, although it does seem to be that in the one well, in the perturbative expansion, as as we would expect. This is something that we can explicitly see. Now, there's another way to discuss what happens at finite n and to impose these finite n constraints. So. One way to impose the constraints that we have at finite n is instead of mapping the phi i's to these bilocals g, we can also work in what's called the g sigma formalism, namely, instead of mapping the phi i's to g, we can just introduce the relation between g and this bilocal uh, expression phi i by putting in a Lagrange multiplier sigma. So we add both a bilocal field g and a bilocal field sigma, both of which do not obey any constraints. And we just add this action that imposes, by the Lagrange multiplier, it imposes this, the g will be the bilocal. So if we write the theory in this way, then here the g's and sigmas are a priori completely unconstrained, and the 
these complicated constraints on G only come when we do the path integral over the sigma so that we impose this. But if we keep both the G and sigma variables, then we do have unconstrained by local variables and we can take this action and work with it without including these extra constraints. So an alternative way to get the gravity theory is to just do here the path integral over the phi i's, which here is quadratic, so we can just explicitly do this path integral. That gives us a bilocal action for g and sigma, which is analogous to what people usually do in, in the SYK model. And then we can take that action, map that to the gravity side. So that will give us an action on the gravity side that has the same fields as before, the gravity fields coming from g, but it also has extra auxiliary fields. In fact, there's one auxiliary field for every physical field uh, that we have. and by construction, if we would do the path integral over these auxiliary fields, then we would get these horrible non-local constraints on the gravity fields. But if we keep also both the fields G and the auxiliary fields, then we do get a, a theory that, that can be written as a path integral over physical gravity fields plus these auxiliary fields. And that does make sense even for finite values of N. So in that sense, we can write down a bulk theory even at finite N at the quantum level, but it has to be with this infinite number of extra auxiliary fields. And again, integrating over them reproduces the complicated constraints uh, that we have before. So uh, let me end uh, with some of the future directions and, and open questions. So as I mentioned, uh, we haven't explicitly shown yet this theory is really equivalent to Vasiliev's high spin gravity. It would be nice to do that. And it would also be nice to somehow find a way to engage fix uh, this formalism. I mean, so we certainly expect that any consistent gravity theory will have deformorphism symmetry and all these high spin generalizations of it. So there should be some way to sort of ungauge fix that symmetry and write down the bulk theory in a way that exhibits these high spin symmetry exactly. But so far we don't know how to do that. And hopefully doing that will enable us to relate to the previous derivations, which did have these high spin symmetries uh, explicit. There are many possible generalizations, uh, some of which we're working on. So one can discuss uh, fermions instead of scalars, that those also have high spin gravities and that's work in progress. We can discuss other ma manifolds. We can discuss d equals one, which uh, is another interesting case for which would be mapped to high spin gravity theory in, in ADS2. Uh, finite temperature, I already mentioned uh, in answering uh, Mark's question. So in order to impose the prediction onto singlets, we have to add the holonomy. And once we add the Yuhan holonomy, then really do the, the matrix model and not just a vector theory. So in that case, unfortunately, we don't know. I mean, we can't just map it to these by local variables. We have many more degrees of freedom. So we don't really know how to discuss finite temperature because we would have to introduce this full uh, integral at least over the holonomy and probably also over additional degrees of freedom. But we can still ask how that behaves like at large n. So at large n, the holonomy is frozen to, to some saddle point. And what we showed so far is that in the larger limit, even if you add a circle, then in the low temperature phase where the holonomy is frozen to just have uh, a uniform eigenvalue distribution, then we did show that that maps to a high-speed gravity theory on thermal ADS phase, as, as we expect. Uh, but of course, the more interesting phase is the high temperature phase where the eigenvalues are, are sorry, a delta function, a distribution. So that would give us the high temperature phase on the field theory, and that we don't know, understand yet how to map to the gravity side. So that's uh, another uh, open question. As was already mentioned, it would be nice to understand the Lorentzian generalization by doing the quotation of everything to the Renson space. We'd like to see that the negative north states decouple. And another interesting question is how to see black holes. So we can certainly construct generic high energy states on the field theory side, and we would expect that those should map to black holes, even though this is a free theory. So they wouldn't thermalize, but we would still expect to have some generic high energy states that would give us black holes. And that would be nice to uh, discover once we understand the Lorentzian uh, generalization. It would also be nice to generalize it to the DS CFT correspondence. So this, these vector models uh, mapping between them in high spin gravity has uh, a, a DS CFT generalization, and it would be nice to repeat all the steps we did for that case. Uh, now, there's an interesting deformation of these UN vector models for three dimensions, which is involves coupling them to churn Simon's matter theory. So I already mentioned that when I discussed how to do the projection onto singlets, but we could also just couple the, these theories to, to you and churn Simon's matter at, at some finite churn Simon's coupling. And that gives an interesting deformation of these theories, which in the limit of large n and large k still has this high spin symmetry. So it should still map to some high spin gravity theory in ADS. So it would be nice to generalize our mapping also to that case, but unfortunately that's much more complicated because we do have now these UN gauge fields, even though there are no physical degrees of freedom. We still have to do the path integral over them. The bilocal isn't, isn't gauge invariant anymore, so it's not clear precisely how to do the mapping for that case. And of course, more ambitiously, we'd like to generalize all these maps to matrix theories, like the free n equals four Young-Wills theory. So again, in that case, there should be some mapping 
in this limit of large n and lambda going to zero between two classical theories. But in that case, we certainly expect to have different topologies in the bulk, different metric metrics and so on. So obviously it's much more complicated, but we hope that uh, our construction, explicit construction still gives us some lessons that may be relevant also for more realistic theories, certainly for these more realistic examples of ADS-CFT and maybe also for fluctuating space times in flat space or in a positive cosmological constant uh, as we have uh, in our universe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Offer, for the very nice talk. Um, do we have any additional questions? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll ask about the just the matrix generalization. Um, do, mm -hmm. do you think these? I mean, would would something like Wilson loops be the the play the role of the G quantities in your in your construction? Or I I, I guess yeah, well, it, a natural sort of gauge invariant. Well, you have Wilson lines, but you also have all these adjoint fields. I mean, so you have, and you have adjoint fields connected by Wilson lines and so on. So yeah, it's not, I mean, obviously you would need the Wilson yeah. lines, but you would also need all these adjoint fields mm -hmm. uh, connected by Wilson lines and and all that. And so, yeah, so unfortunately it's not clear what, what is the full set of variables. And of course we know all the, we know what all the local operators are, but of course, even the list of local operators is much bigger when we have matrices. And, and there are also all these additional non-local operators, which should also be there, all the Wilson lines and, and all those. So yeah, it, it would be very good to understand what is the full set of variables in that case, I mean, maybe in lower dimensions, we can hope to understand that and or in these stern Samus theories, which should also be simpler than full-fledged matrix theories. So yeah, that's, mm -hmm. those are all very interesting questions. I mean, of course, in some sense, we expect that in those cases, and at least in the two of them, they should map to string theories, but it's not clear how that would show. I mean, so yeah, so somehow, of course, the Wilson lines should in some sense map to strings, but then also all these other all these other operators that involve also the adjoints should also map to the sort of states of the same strings and so on. So precisely how you package everything into a single string theory is, uh, of course, mm. uh, still an open question. A question about the, the thermal state. Mm -hmm. So in yeah. theory, because you have all these conserved charges, the natural thing is, is the what's called the generalized Gibson sample, where you don't mm -hmm. just give a chemical potential to the energy, but all those other charges. Right. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So we, so we haven't thought of that. I mean, so I don't. Does that have a, any nice Euclidean description? Uh, I, I don't know in terms uh, of some. Uh, yeah. No. That's that's sort of my question. Okay, yeah, so, so I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. I think that's the thing that will be more right. like. Yeah, so obviously for spin one and spin two, we do know how to do that in Euclidean space, just by turning on some chemical potential and, and putting the theory on a circle. But mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if it's, it's known how to do that for the high spin fields. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I don't know. But indeed, that may be the more natural ensemble. Of course, uh, in Lorentz end space, you could also just consider the, the microcanonical ensemble, and, and then that should also have some mapping. and. So that would be the, the easiest thing to check, but yeah, but if we want to discuss finite temperature, I agree that it makes just as much sense to to do a Lozano transform with respect to all the variables, and it would yeah. be interesting to understand that, yes. Uh, over, so over can I... signature, sorry, 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 even in Lorentzian signature, it's a kind of more natural to fix all the conserved charges in some sense. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's true, yes. Okay. Right, and yeah, that, so yeah, so maybe, yeah, there, there may be, so it, yeah, I don't know if it, yeah, it's probably it's not sort of like a typical states that have all the all the charges given by something and ask what those behave like. And yeah, that's yes, exactly. right. That is, is definitely a, a good point, yes. Uh, the, the problem in the high temperature phase is from the gravity side or from the field theory side? Well, the gravity side, also I don't know anything, but, yeah, but for exactly. our point of view, we're starting from, from the, the field theory, theory side and we want to map that. But yeah, so the problem is just mapping on the field theory side. So on the field theory side, I can start in this large limit by just taking the same right. field theory, but coupled to this UN holonomy where all the right. eigenvalues are equal to each other. And then I don't know how to, we, do, we haven't been able to map that to the gravity side. I mean, so it certainly doesn't map to gravity just on thermal ADS or anything like that. So we haven't, so we, we I believe that there should be some nice mapping of that to the gravity side, which would be gravity on some manifold, but we haven't found a nice mapping to gravity variables of, of but, that but, theory. But in the low temperature phase, you managed to do it. So what goes right. wrong in the other case, um, technically? Well, 
yes. Yeah, so, so, so technically, uh, from the point of view of these bilocal variables, so, so we're mapping these bilocal variables to, to, the, to the variables in ADS space. So, so technically, on the filtering side, when we put a defined temperature, then we have periodicity both in X1 and in X2, a priori. Now, it turns out that if the eigenvalue distribution is uniform, then this double periodicity just maps to a periodicity of X just in the, in the Euclidean time direction of, of thermal ADS space. But if all the eigenvalues distribution, if the, all the eigenvalues are, are equal to each other with the holonomy, then this double of periodicity maps to some much more complicated. So, I mean, of course, it includes also the periodicity in, in X on the ADS side, but it includes an extra periodicity that's not just uh, the, I mean, the, that, that still survives in the larger limit and that gives an extra complicated constraint on these fields. And we don't know how to find a geometric interpretation for those extra constraints. So that's again, just because these, here we have two circles in some sense and we have a double periodicity and we need to map that to the gravity side. So that's where we got stuck, but yeah, hopefully somebody will have a good idea for how to do it. I mean, it's certainly, we certainly have the explicit path integral on the gravity on the field basically to find nice mapping to the gravity side. You mentioned a generalization to D equals one. Is it related yes. to this work on higher spin JT by Yore Frutov? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, in, the, in their case, the typically the, the quantum mechanics is much more complicated. I mean, here the generalization would really be just n quantum mechanical scalar degrees of freedom. I mean, taking UN singlets. I mean, so it's really a very simple theory. I mean, no disorder or anything like that. And on, on the gravity side, uh, also in, in that case, the theory simplifies. I mean, of course, we don't have any dynamical spin J fields and so on. They've gone ADS too. I mean, so it, it will be some topological gravity theory just with one. I think the dynamics does involve just one scalar field. So in that sense, it is similar to JT gravity, but uh, Although, well, for complex U and you would also get one complex dynamical field, one, uh, sorry, spin one dynamical field. But yeah, of course, all the higher spin fields are not dynamical, but I would expect it to be a very different theory from JT gravity. I mean, uh, but yeah, I mean, we haven't worked it out, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Of course, two, yeah, I mean, the, the reason we, had do, we don't do two dimensions is that they're really, because all these gravity fields are non-dynamical, it's not so clear what are the right questions to ask. I mean, uh, so it's not, uh, it's less obvious. I mean, uh, well, here, I mean, I do, of course, like the fact that we are constructing real gravity theories with dynamical gravitons and so on, unlike in all the lower dimensional cases, which don't have dynamical gravitons. So here, if we do have dynamical gravitons, I mean, but I mean, the price to pay is that they're highly non-local, but we do have dynamical gravitons at least. You mentioned uh, earlier derivations by a couple of groups. Um, can, can you just remind us what what they were doing and, and how it relates to what you're doing? So I don't know. I don't know what's the relation. I mean, but or, or, what they yeah, were doing was it was, it was similar in the sense that they also in some cases started from these by locals and, and tried to identify sort of the distance tried to do some RG flow on, on these by locals and then identify this RG direction as, as some radial direction. So they wrote down sort of the analog of, of these, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, these, uh, sorry, I, the name escapes me of, of these, these gravity equations that are usually dual to the RG equations. Uh, I mean, it's, it's this usual. Uh, Hamilton Jacobi. Yeah, exactly right. So, so they were done these Hamilton Jacobi equations in the bulk and, and for these by local variables and try to rewrite those as, as a spin J field th theory where, where sort of the, the freedom of doing different RG transformations at different points, they try to map that into the high spin, the freedom of the high spin gravity gauge transformations. So, I mean, it's, in some sense, it starts from the same, the same. Uh, identification of by locals with bulk fields, but it maps them in, in a very different language. I mean, so, so I mean, presumably also in that case, maybe some gauge fixing of that would give what we do, but I, I don't know the precise relation. I see. Buffer, in, uh, in uh, your one over n expansion of the by local field theory, you notice mm -hmm. some cancellation of interactions in a sense uh, right. Can, can you think of that as a kind of localization, and uh, would there be a more sophisticated way to see it? As, as, as kind of what? Sorry, I missed. Uh... Localization. Oh. Um... Exactness of the semi-classical limit. Yeah, that's 
that's a good question and i don't think so i mean uh but yeah possibly possibly that's true i mean it's I mean, of course, there is also the critical UN model. So if we go to the critical UN model, then the bulk loops do not cancel anymore. And in that context, we, we can also do the computations in the bulk and there they would just give us finite answers from all the loops. But it's possible that in the, in the specific case of the dual to the free theory, yeah, maybe there is some localization. Uh, yeah, we haven't thought of it in this language. I mean, we just describe it by, by standard rules of perturbation theory in ADS, but maybe there's a way to see that it localizes. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Okay, do you have any more questions? If we don't, let's thank Offer again. Okay, so thanks. It was good to see you all, and uh, hopefully thanks. next time in person. Theater Offer.